عباده الذي نصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam We welcome you today from a place called Kinrara Is that how it's pronounced? Kinrara In Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia Where our son uh, Faris has opened a uh, car wash place Maybe that's why we have so much rain today <laughs> And uh, Today's function is to inaugurate his new business and he's asked us to come to look at the subject of business ethics in Islam. Ethics is that branch of knowledge in Arabic al-akhlaq, al-akhlaq. Ethics is that branch of knowledge which determines what is good and what is evil what is virtuous what is vice hmm? uh, <coughs> what is morally commendable and morally we disapprove of and it is from ethics that we derive our law what is halal and what is haram You cannot have law without first having ethics or morality. And uh, we are now looking at ethics as it applies to business and business transactions. And uh, the first thing we'll do is to look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam in which he said Pay the laborer his wage before the sweat on his forehead dries up. Do not delay in paying a laborer his wage after he has completed his work indicating from this command that if we were to delay in paying a man his wage and keep him waiting and he has to knock from pillar to post to try to get the money for which he has already worked that this is something which the Prophet disapproves of this is ethically or morally wrong in fact if a man has done the job and you do not pay him his wage but keep him waiting for it you are oppressing him and the one thing that is so remarkable about the religion of Islam which is of course the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam is the religion that came to Ibrahim alayhi salam the prophet Abraham and therefore the Christians know about this and the Jews know about this it is the same religion which came to Moses Musa alayhi salam and so the Christians know about it and the Jews know about it and it's the same religion which came to Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa salam what is remarkable about this one true religion is that it has zero tolerance for oppression zero tolerance for oppression and so we must be careful not to oppress people not to oppress a laborer but to pay the wage as soon as the job is finished 
But now we come to the wage that is paid. How do we pay a wage? <laughs> we have to pay a wage in money. That's how we pay a wage, in money. And uh, what money do we use? If we use a money in which the value of the money is constantly diminishing, money is constantly losing value, then the wage that that man gets for his labor, that wage would not store the value of his labor. For example, he worked for the whole month and we now have to pay him his wage at the end of the month. The wage that he gets can buy five sheep. But when he gets this wage from you, you pay him in a money which is constantly losing value like the US dollar which is the key they call it currency the key currency in the world today is called the US dollar in 19 in the 1920s 20 US dollars had the value of one ounce of gold and by 1944 it took 35 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold and then by 1971 to 73 it took 40 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold and then in October 73, it took 160 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold. And then in January 1980, it took 850 US dollars to buy one ounce of gold. And today, it takes more than 1700 US dollars to buy the same one ounce of gold. So if that man had stored his wage in US dollars then after a while it could no longer buy five sheep it could buy only four and then three and then two and then one and then finally you can't even buy a sheep that's not fair in the Quran Allah has repeated a command three times He says, وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشِيَاءَهُمْ Do not diminish the value of people's things, people's properties, people's wealth, people's wages. The money which we are now using around the world does precisely that. It diminishes the value as the money falls in value. Hence, ethically and morally, this is something which must be condemned. So, pay the laborer his wage before the sweat dries on his forehead means not only to pay him without delay, don't keep him waiting for his wage, but secondly, to pay him a wage which will not be constantly diminishing in value. When we use the money that Allah created, which is still in the Quran up to now, the dinar, and the dirham that money never lost value 
if you paid your wage in dinars 5,000 years ago and with that wage you could buy five sheep today 5,000 years later if you paid the same wage it could still buy the five sheep and so the money that we had the dinar and the dirham functioned successfully as money in storing value and the money that we keep that we now have which has come from a source that I'll introduce to you in a moment that money is haram in accordance with this verse of the Quran repeated three times in the Quran what was the verse Wala do not cause bachs bachs to become little hmm? do not cause people's wealth people's properties people's wages to diminish in value where did this money come from? Let us begin this talk this morning, this afternoon with this verse of the Quran that I have repeated several times. I have explained it several times, I have translated it several times and yet for some strange and mysterious reason we get no response, none, zero from the world of Islamic scholarship. I don't know why why will they not respond? This is the verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who have faith in Allah La tattakhidhu al-yahuda wal nasara awliya Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies and because we use the right methodology in studying the Quran, not the wrong methodology of taking a verse in isolation, because we use the right methodology, we know from the rest of the Quran that Allah could not possibly be referring to all Jews, could not possibly be referring to all Christians, not at all. Well then, if he's not referring to all Jews and all Christians, which Jews, which Christians is he referring to? And the answer comes right in the words which follow, meaning, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies, who themselves are friends and allies of each other who themselves ba'aduhum hum ba'aduhum awliya'u ba' who themselves are friends and allies of each other the Quran is anticipating a moment which is to come when a mysterious reconciliation will take place between some Christians and some Jews and when that reconciliation takes place then a Jewish Christian friendship and a Jewish Christian alliance will emerge in the world and the Quran is telling us, warning us that when that Jewish Christian friendship and alliance appears in the world you are prohibited from maintaining friendly ties with them you are prohibited from becoming their allies and if you do that if you defy Allah you defy the Quran and you maintain friendly ties with them and join in their alliance what is the price that you would pay the Quran answers whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance you now belong to them you have lost your Islam in the surely Allah does not guide a people who are wicked 
indicating that this Jewish Christian alliance is going to be a wicked alliance. Has that alliance emerged? Of course it has. Of course it has. It is a Zionist Christian, Zionist Jewish alliance which has bonded together part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world. This is Western Christianity, the Vatican huh? and the Church of England, but not Eastern Christianity, which was Byzantium yesterday, no, that the Quran refers to as Rome, Rome. And the leadership of Russia today is not Rome, no. The leadership of Russia today is not room, but Russia is room. Room is there in Russia, indicating that tomorrow we're going to see some changes in Russia. And you can see a Christian, Christian leadership emerging in Russia, and Allah knows best. This verse of the Quran is today fulfilled in the world. And the money that we are now using for our business transactions has come from them. It is paper money, paper currencies, and electronic money. It is bogus, it is fraudulent, it is haram, and we don't need in today's lecture to go over that subject anymore because we've done it several times in our lectures on Islam and money and Islam and the international monetary system and the prohibition of riba. We don't need to repeat it today. And so when you pay the laborer his wage and you pay him a wage in money which is bogus and fraudulent and haram, <laughs> how can this be ethically acceptable? No. This is ethically repugnant. You must pay him the wage in money which is halal, not haram. And so we're moving forward now with business ethics in Islam. Every business transaction which uses paper money and uses electronic money as the medium of exchange is a haram transaction but we are using it we all are using it all of us that does not mean that we should not condemn it because that's the first step on the way to getting out of this hole in which we are now located the reason why this topic is so important about business ethics in Islam is because Islam has given to the world insofar as business is concerned something called a free and a fair market. What is a free and a fair market? It is not only a market in which money, money is halal money, gold and silver coins, money with intrinsic value, money which does not constantly lose its value. But more than that, a free and a fair market is a market in which you don't have thieves. No. Allah says in the Quran, وَأَلَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى that if you want to reap, you must plant. If you want to reap, you must plant. Hmm? So if you are reaping without planting, you're stealing from somebody. That's not a fair market. And Islam is so insistent on a fair market that it has promulgated a law of punishment or had of cutting off the hand of the thief that is a severe punishment cutting off the hand of a thief why not of course if the thief 
steals a mango from your mango tree, we're not going to cut off his hand for that. No. It has to be something of a certain value, significant value, before we cut off your hand. Hmm? The reason why there is this severe punishment of cutting off the hand of the thief is because Islam is so absolutely insistent on the preservation of a fair market. If we were to enforce that law today, there will be lots of bankers without hands. <laughs> if we were to enforce that law today, central bank without, the hand, without a hand. If we were to enforce that, line, that law today, downtown Manhattan would be handless. Hmm? The financial centers in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in New York and London, will see lots of people losing their hands. Why? Because you're reaping without planting. You're stealing. You have a plan with which you attack a particular currency. And as the currency falls, you make a windfall. <laughs> Somebody's loss becomes your gain. That's nasty. That's repugnant. That my gain should be your loss. That's not business. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about business. He says in the Quran, Wahallahu al bay'a wa harram al riba. And Allah has made business halal and He has made riba haram. Why is riba haram? And today the market is saturated with riba. Hmm? Because in a riba transaction there is no risk. No, you are lending money and you are immunized from loss. You're going to get back your capital with the interest. That's not business. A business transaction is one in which you can either make a profit or you can suffer loss. And so a business transaction involves risk. The money lender does not want to embrace risk. And as a consequence of the market becoming saturated with riba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no longer, no longer will cause some to suffer loss and others to get gain in consequence of which money would circulate through the economy because he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you loss and give him gain but when money is lent on interest then the rich are immunized from loss and as a consequence the rich now remain permanently rich, the poor are now imprisoned in permanent poverty, the rich go richer and the poor go poorer. When the rich get their interest on their loan, they're doing so in a manner which is fraudulent because they're assuming no risk. And so they're sitting down home doing nothing, 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 no, maybe playing tennis in the backyard. And their money is working for them. <laughs> and they're becoming richer and richer and richer and richer. Allah says about them, وَأَكْلِهِمْ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ بِالْبَاطِلِ And they consume the wealth of mankind unlawfully. وَأَكْلِهِمْ Amwal and nursi bil batil. And Allah has prepared a terrible punishment for such people. A market which is a fair market, therefore, is a market in which we prevent the thief <laughs> who comes and steals your cow from your backyard. But also a market which will prevent George Soros from coming and stealing 
500 billion US dollars from Malaysia because he can attack the currency. Both are the same thing. Stealing. And for that the punishment is cutting off the hand of the thief. In order for the market to be a fair market, we must insist on business. And lending money on interest is not business. But in order for the market to be a fair market, a fair market means that no one should have any advantage over others in the market. You cannot say that because you are Malay that the government is going to give preferential treatment to the Malay over the others. That's not fair. In order for the market to be a fair market, it must be a market which does not discriminate against anyone or in favor of anyone. Because my father is the, the minister, I get the contract. That's not a fair market. Hmm? Anything which acts in this way to unjustly give you an advantage, to unjustly give you a gain or a profit to which you are not justly entitled. Nabi Muhammad called it riba, riba. And so business ethics in Islam when it insists on a free and a fair market insists therefore on a market which does not discriminate in favor of anyone or against anyone. So can we enforce a business boycott of Israeli goods? Everybody will raise their hand and say yes. Let's boycott Israel. If I ask for hands to be raised today, everybody will raise their hands. Let's boycott Israeli goods. And since Denmark is doing what Denmark is doing, let us boycott Denmark goods, goods as well. So no butter from Denmark. Huh? <laughs> the question is, since Islam insists on a free and a fair market, is it permissible in Islam to use trade as a weapon? Can we as Muslims approve of what the UN Security Council does? Namely, you impose an economic boycott on a country. Have a seat. Join us. Are we allowed as Muslims to do what Ronald Reagan did? <laughs> when he spoke of the Soviet Union as an evil empire and impose an economic boycott on the Soviet Union. Can we do what the Security Council is now doing in imposing economic boycotts on Iran, on Korea? Hmm? So, if we had the time, we'll ask you to show your hands. Every Muslim will raise his hand and say, let us boycott Israeli goods. But the answer is no. Islam does not permit the use of trade as a weapon. No. <laughs> and it is time for us to teach our people the deed. We do not use trade as a weapon. Islam permits you to trade even with your enemies. But you may not trade in weapons of war with your enemies. Hmm? And so if a man who worships the one God is selling mangoes in the market 
And another man who worships a dozen gods and goddesses is also selling mangoes in the market. And this Englishman who says, I don't worship any god at all, that's most Englishmen like that today, and he's also selling mangoes in the market. You do not, you do not determine who you're going to buy your mangoes from based upon what are his beliefs. The market does not operate that way. No. It's not an old boys network. No. <laughs> you have to see the quality of the mangoes. You have to look at the price of the mangoes.